Hey friends, Peggy Hall back with you from the healthyamerican.org. So many of you have been asking me for this interview with Dr. Sam Bailey. If you're not sure who Dr. Sam is, you probably will recognize her here. This is her website, Sam. Ba it's drsambailey.com. And I will have a link for you in the description box below. She is, a well, she had her license, which she gave up as a medical doctor. She practiced for many years. And in the interview that I'm going to share with you, she's going to talk about how she really um, broke free from the mainstream medical merry-go-round along with her husband, Dr. Mark Bailey. And you are going to love this interview. Now, Dr. Sam and Dr. Mark have been excoriated even in the truth movement, because they are the voices that are speaking out against, well, let me just call it the theory, because that's what it is, the theory of virology. And you'll see that she, Dr. Sam, is a co-author of the book, Virus Mania. She also has been featured in the terrain therapy. She and I were among other featured uh, participants in the movie Terrain. And I know that you are going to love this interview. So before we hop onto that interview, which by the way, actually is I'm giving you an edited version of our private live webinars that we do every month. I want to entice you and encourage you to join us. And this month we have Dr. Chari. I'll have an, a brief interview with her tomorrow and we'll give you a little sneak peek as to what we're going to talk about in our un censored private live webinars. Now, these are recorded if you can't make it live. And everyone who is a subscriber to my Substack, a paid subscriber to the Substack, anyone that has been a paid subscriber to PeggyHall.tv, or if you have sent a check or you have donated online, you are invited. This is a special private program for all of my supporters. It's my way of supporting you and thanking you because I literally could not do this work without your help. And I'm also grateful to the sponsors of my show because that's how I am able to continue to bring you this information day in, day out. I'm here every afternoon, 4 p.m. Pacific. And let's hear from our friends over at noblegoldinvestments.com. In this world of economic uncertainty, safeguarding your retirement savings is more important than ever. Gold is a trusted source of value providing stability for centuries through countless market cycles. With a gold IRA from Noble Gold Investments, you can protect your financial future with the enduring power of precious metals. So don't let election volatility erode your hard-earned nest egg. You can vote for the timeless safety of gold and silver in 2024. And for all of my Trump fans, you will get 10 of these one ounce silver Trump coins. Or if you prefer not to get that, you can opt for this 10 ounce silver American flag bar with your qualifying account. Noble Gold Investments, they are your partner in financial peace of mind in 2024. Give them a call at 877-646-5347. I'll have a link for you in the description box below, along with the disclaimer that there's always a risk of investment. There's no guarantee of any kind, but find out for yourself by giving them a call or clicking on noblegoldinvestments.com. All right, friends, sit back and enjoy this very special interview with Dr. Sam Bailey and Dr. Mark Bailey. It has to be edited because of the censorship on this public platform, but uh, when you join us as a valued financial partner, you get access to the entire video, plus all of the interviews and the private webinars that we've had going on two years. So sit back, enjoy, and I appreciate you being a part of our Healthy American family. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Dr. Sam. How are you? Hi, Dr. Mark. Very excited. <laughs> oh, great to have you here. Not in my normal filming location, although I would love if this was, but I want to thank you so much for joining us all the way from New Zealand, who basically are heroes. They, Dr. Sam Bailey is a content creator. She's a medical author. She's a health educator. And after training and practicing within the medical system for two decades, she commenced a new phase of understanding and promoting health as a wider concept. I'm going to let everybody know that you can find her at 
drsambailey.com. And you can also learn about her husband. And she works alongside Mark, who has been the duo's chief researcher since 2020. And Dr. Mark Bailey also focuses on microbiology, the existence of viruses. Both of them our team, no virus. And they've been exposing what I call the cooties fraud for many years. So friends, I've had guest speakers in the past who told us that they had COVID and they were tested positive for COVID and they went to the hospital and got treatments for it. And my heart goes out to everyone who has suffered with any kind of illness or medical or health challenge, but to pin it on the existence of a virus is really what we're going to be talking about in our webinar. And so people are very excited because I would say by and large, healthy Americans are very discerning. They like to question, they dig deeper, and they are very eager to hear all about what you have to share. So please fill in the blanks with your background. I know, Dr. Sam, we've spoken before. So grateful to have you here. Take us back to 2020 and prior to that and, <laughs> and buckle up everybody for the ride. Yeah, well, I guess just, um, I had a YouTube channel that I started in um, late 2019. And um, the audience was asking a lot about coronavirus, as it was known back then, and uh, and what, what it is and what's happening in China and Wuhan. And Mark actually found um, a book called Virus Mania, which was written by two German authors who basically go through the history of pandemics and how um, these aren't just accidents <laughs> and basically... Uh, Mark would sit me down and read passages of this book to me and it would be something about HIV or flu, the contagion experiments, the Spanish flu contagion experiments. And it was so shocking to me. I had to read this book as well. And it had a profound influence on the YouTube content that I started making. And anyway, um, so these themes of virus mania started appearing in, um, in my YouTube videos. And then in September 2020, um, all hell broke loose because I made a video um, on the, I knew someone that was uh, in charge of the PCR, making doing the PCR tests in New Zealand, like a clinic that they were testing and that had, that had no funding. So they'd been running no tests um, at all. And therefore there were no cases. And then she told me that there was a whole lot of funding had just flooded in and they were going to open up the testing again and this, so this is August 2020 and I knew if they did that that there was going to be new a, a lot more cases so I made a video about this and I also um, said in this particular video that I wouldn't take the cooties jab if and when it came about and um, and that <laughs> at the time I was a TV presenter a, a show a, like a host um, for a mainstream network in New Zealand uh, I was halfway through filming a second season. I was working as a doctor and I basically got a phone call from the lawyer of the show saying, you know, take this video down. And I said, I wouldn't. And they said, well, just take out the bit on vaccines and I, sorry, on jabs. And, um, and I knew that that was the start of it. So um, I got investigated by the medical council, the authorities in New Zealand, smear articles, fact checks. I lost my job. Um, it was quite crazy um, over about a two week period. And um, then I felt like it was the hand of God helping me, but um, I had uh, the author of Virus Mania reached out to me. He didn't know that I'd read this book and it had such a profound effect on uh, my life and said, could you interview, would you like to interview um, one of the authors? I said, please, we got on so well that I ended up becoming a co-author of this book it was just one of those amazing situations and then mark really oh, i'll let mark sorry yeah well peggy i um i left the medical system in 2016 and I, i'd been a doctor for 16 years and i'd had a lot of uh speed bumps if you like during that time and was basically a skeptic from day one from the day i graduated I spent about five years as a professional athlete, which I loved, but I, I kept a medical license and stayed in the system, just working here and there. And then, but in 2016, I turned 40 and I was so done with medicine that I said to Sam, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm pulling out permanently, not coming back. And I think between those years, 2016 up to 2019, I was more and more horrified with 
be what doctors do and you know slowly found myself becoming uh you know more and more skeptical more and more horrified if you like about what the medical system was I'd spent those years trying to get Sam out of the medical system too. <laughs> I said to her, I think you should get out because I've just got such a bad feeling about it. I just don't think it's going in the right direction. So when the sort of start of 2020 came along, you know, you can understand I was already looking at medicine going, it's already dubious. And the whole thing when the WHO started doing their press releases made no sense. And I said to Sam, I think something's wrong, something's badly wrong with the situation. And pretty soon, as Sam says, we were investigating virology and our deeper investigations into that started around March 2020 when we discovered uh, virus mania and it took off from there. And, um, you know, as you know, the last uh, four or five years we have spent just blowing apart the whole germ theory, virology, building on the work of Stephen Lanker, Kevin Corbett, the Perth Group, David Crow, all of those uh, pioneers who started questioning the fundamentals behind contagion, uh, the existence of viruses, uh, vaccines, etc. And uh, yeah, and you know what's what's been a real blessing for us is that people say to us, oh my goodness, you guys had these established medical careers. We were literally on covers of magazines sometimes because they, they when we were doing what they wanted, they were very happy, of course. And um, in 2020, we became, you know, these um, objects of attack, basically, by the authorities and the media, et cetera. But we found we absolutely love what we do. It's it's just incredible. Our research now is it's not hindered by any institutions. Um, we don't work for anyone. We're not bound to universities or pharmaceutical companies or commercial research agencies. We simply do our own research and publish it, and it's it's incredibly liberating and uh, and really I think um, a sense of purpose. And we we didn't actually have that when we were me medical doctors in the system, we sort of felt just cogs in the machine. So I think, you know, with all the madness that COVID's brought, I mean, it's brought us to people like you as well. And we really appreciate that because I don't think um, we would have ever made these connections had we not had the madness. Yeah, these are the hidden blessings, that's for sure, that we've made these connections. We actually are what much more well informed than we were prior to this. So all of their diabolical plans really backfire. And we're going to dig in a little bit in and the, as you called it, the fundamentals of germ theory and virology. And I remember years ago that I used to do a radio show and it was for general health and wellness, like how to get a good night's sleep and, uh, you know, different stretches you can do to get rid of neck pain. And I remember talking about, uh, sort of home remedies for colds and flu. And the question came up, well, what's the difference between a cold and a flu? And then I started doing just layman's research about flu and viruses. And what was published was just simple statements such as these are inert non-life forms that hijack a living cell and replicate. And I thought, okay, I'm not a medical doctor. I didn't go to medical school, but that doesn't make sense to me that non-life can so-called procreate with life and create new, it, none of that made sense, even to just on a basic level. And people were trying to explain it to me like, oh, it's like having a CD that you insert into a CD player. It won't play, you know, the virus is the CD. It has to go into the CD player and then you turn it on. I'm like, but what turns it on and how does it get into the cell? And there's no energy or metabolism or life cycle. So I was questioning this just as a bystander years ago. And so I want to applaud both of you. It is stunning to me. As you say, you were on magazines, Dr. Sam on TV. You're both so well-educated and well-spoken and persuasive. And that is why they probably uh, came down so hard on you because you are so compelling. You can explain things clearly and you were not beholden to these you know, pharmaceutical companies, the medical schools, the fact that you come from mainstream medicine makes your position so much stronger. I have several questions that people 
we're sending in and we're asking. And the number one question, just again, for a little bit of background before we get into the science and medicine, just tell us, we saw in the United States what was going on in New Zealand. We looked at New Zealand with horror in that it was one of the most shut down places with the fewest cases, uh, if we want to even play in their playground there. But what was like day-to-day life? Like, could you go shopping? Could you go out? Were there any other people that felt like you did? Take us back and give us sort of the eyewitness of what it was like in New Zealand. Yeah, well, I guess in the the first lockdown, it was pretty <laughs> crazy. I mean, uh, we almost thought it was a joke because we didn't listen to the mainstream media. So when people said you won't be able to talk with other people at all, like you had to stay in your bubble of your family, <sighs> I was like, what? Like this is this sounds made up to me. <laughs> and but it was kind of like I just remember those incidents. Uh, for me, one thing that always strikes me was the very first time I went to the supermarket after the lockdown. And I remember going and there was just this massive queue and everyone was spaced two meters apart, you know. And I thought this is going to take me an hour just to get into the supermarket, just because this and you could only go in one at a time. And I remember walking in and there was someone wearing a, a gas mask. And I thought, like, it's so shocking to see, because we didn't have masks like everybody else did. That was what was different. We were locked down, but we didn't have, nobody really wore masks. And so wearing, seeing someone wearing a gas mask. And I remember coming home and I remember crying because I said to Mark, because I'd read, you know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the um, Gulag Archipelago. Mm-hmm. And I thought, this has happened. This is here. Like, it's not just an imaginary. This is actually here right now. We are living in a totalitarian state. I think too, Peggy, what happened was that, as you know, the whole lockstep thing, our government is just middle management. So a week before this, they're going, oh, yeah, we're not really doing anything. (laughs) Over a couple of days, they go, oh, actually, we're going to lock everyone down now. And we were just, we were almost laughing because we were asking neighbours and friends, this is a scam, can't you see it? And people were scared. And this is what it comes down to. People who have been convinced contagion's real, that germs could kill them, this is why they go along with it. It's not because they're terrified that, you know, the police might arrest them and stuff. I think they're actually scared that um, they might get killed by the germ or they might pass it on to someone else. So, yeah, but to be honest... um, when we we weren't paying attention to the mainstream news, <laughs> we inadvertently went on holiday, not not realizing that that was not permitted, you know, by the authorities. So we went to a spot, and our kids were playing on a beach, and we thought this is fantastic because we're the only ones here, and we had people driving past, like waving and giving us the thumbs up, and we thought, what what's going on here, you know? And we didn't realize that you weren't supposed to go to the beach and all that. That was stuff. illegal. <laughs> yeah. And um, we were telling people, no, it's fine, you can travel and stuff. And we honestly, it wasn't until we got back and we looked at the government website and they had all these rules and we were like, well, we're not doing that. That's just absolutely stupid. So the, there were enough people around who were ignoring it um, so that you could still have gatherings and a couple of restaurants in our city said they're not going along with this, so they stayed open. And um, yeah, it was pretty crazy. But um, I think every country had their form of absolute madness. Like as Sam says, in 2020, we had no people didn't wear face masks that that came along later, Mm, you know, that then they stopped the lockdowns and then said everyone has to you can go out and about, but you have to wear a face mask. And then, of course, they bring in the vaccine mandates and, you know, people have these passport things on their phones and they say that you're not allowed to go into buildings and um, you can't go to public places unless you've got this um, vaccine pass. Now, a lot of people just got fake ones. That was easy enough to do. We we didn't do that because yeah. we just told businesses we're not mm-hmm. doing it. Right. And if a business if a business refused access to us, we'd, we'd just say to them, we're ending all business with you forever. Right. And, exactly. Um, we did. And so we found new businesses um, to, you know, uh, exchange with and that and it was actually really good because we found this whole new community of real people who are really interested in building proper um, honest communities I love that I think many people can relate to that that they stood up 
same with me. I did not do any business. I still refuse. We have, you know, this giant, I don't know if you have Costco, it's like the major warehouse store that people go to. And they were one of the worst. And I tore up my membership. I never went back. I never will go back. And it's just on principle. And those are things, you know, people will have this idea of we need a worldwide, um, you know, protests. Well, they've there have been so many worldwide protests that didn't do anything. What works is exactly what you described. You individually going on holiday, you individually not going to those merchants, you individually finding other people. That's the only thing that works is the smallest unit, the family, the individual making choices. I'm not saying they're easy. There are plenty of people over the several years that I've helped that had those hard decisions of not traveling to see their grandchildren. Uh, I had a client who decided she was not going to travel. Her mom was actually in Germany and she was in her last, you know, dying days. And the mom said, do not, I, I do not want you to come and give up your freedom. This is what we fought for. So people made difficult decisions, but they stood in dignity and integrity. You, your careers, your, your uh, reputation, you know, you are standing and have been standing for truth, for your convictions. Many people didn't know how to do that. And what I saw in California anyway, which was California, New York, Hawaii, among the worst, the absolute worst. California declared the first shutdown. It was very, very hostile. And, you know, which is so strange. But as you said, Dr. Mark, people actually were afraid. So I think there are there's a category of people who really did fall for this. They believe in the contagion. They believe. I had extended cousins that said, oh, I, I could never go outside. I would never forgive myself if I killed someone. I'm like, oh, you're running around with a machete? <laughs> what do you mean? And she said, no, if I breathed on them, if I infected them. And I thought, I, I, can't, I can't really even have this conversation because she would rather stay home wear a mask at home inside. And suddenly, sadly, she was like a doctor. She was like, a, she was saving lives by staying home. So this other narrative of you're doing something by putting your life on hold, it, it's so destructive. So there are people that fell for that and they believed it. And I, I'm going to, what can I do? I pray for them in time. I think some of them came around. I know some of them did because they got one or two jabs and then came and asked me how they can stop doing that and still keep their jobs. So they did come around to that. Some doctors told me that not only are they never getting the cooties, that's I call it, the, the COVID uh, vaccine, but they're never getting a flu vaccine, hepatitis vaccine, a TB uh, test. They just are no longer going along with any of that. So it majorly backfired. And then there were people who wanted to stand up they didn't know how, they didn't know the rights, they may not have had know, the wherewithal or the confidence. And then many people developed that confidence. They said, I didn't, I can't believe I walked into a store without wearing a mask and, and I nobody said anything. I'm like, there, you see, you just have to try. What I can't tolerate, <laughs> Lord forgive me, is those who know that it's wrong, but they go along with it anyway, because they don't want to make waves. That's a different category. And those, at least in the United States, I think, paved the way for more tyranny and oppression because they didn't stand up and they knew it was wrong. I don't really even fault the ones that go along with it. For some reason, they're not unable to discern or understand. But the ones that knew it was wrong, that's, that's a little tougher.